Welcome back, everyone. This is Intro to Physical Anthropology. Uh, I am your instructor, David Leitner. Today, we are going to talk about what science is. Um, anthropology is a science, and every branch of anthropology integrates with science in some way or another. And for physical anthropology, that's principally through biology, evolution, medicine, um, all of the ways we have of scientifically studying the human body and the human organism. Now, just what is a science? First thing about, a, about something, if it's scientific, is that it has to focus on the natural world. Um, and it has to explain that natural world. So, in other words, science uses natural explanations for to explain natural phenomena. Uh, so, by definition, um, anything that is supernatural is not part of the natural world. It breaks the laws of nature. And this is the most important thing because science only works because it's predicated on this notion that the laws of nature will be consistent throughout time, throughout the universe, okay? There may be circumstances that change them locally, but by and large, the laws will remain consistent. There won't be um, random exceptions to it. So ghosts cannot exist, uh, or at least can't be studied scientifically because the very all of the explanations of what ghosts are violate um, the um, laws of the conservation of energy uh, and entropy and a whole bunch of other things. So they go against the laws of nature, which means we can't study it scientifically. The same goes for um, a traditional sort of Christian notion of God uh, as omnipotent and om omniscient uh um, able to alter events at any moment in any way uh, it chooses. Um, that means breaking the laws of nature at will. And you will actually find many Christian sort of uh, denominations, whole, as well as uh, non Christian denominations that are monotheists, like Judaism and so forth that hold that actually, no, God doesn't, he, he's got to play by his own rules, or its own rules, their own rules. Um, God can't just decide one day to change things. And this is important because you can't study something that can change the rules on you. You can't study it scientifically. So we need natural explanations for natural, natural causes for, to explain natural phenomena. Um, next, and very important, the ideas have to be testable. You have to be able to put them up against evidence from the natural world. And here's the, the next thing, which it, it relies on evidence from the natural world. Things you actually observe um, or, or predict you will observe and then go out and find. Um, ideas that aren't testable are things like, uh, not, to, not that I have a sort of axe to grain with religion. It's just that this is, that it's important to understand the differences between religious ways of knowing the world and scientific ways of knowing the world. Um, if you have an omnipotent and omniscient God, then any explanation, any time I find evidence that is inconsistent uh, with your explanation that God did it, you can go back and say, yes, but God meant you to see that and believe that to test you. And so testing is meaningless in that case. Testing the laws of nature means nothing. Because, again, 
you can't rely on the results in that kind of world. So science is predicated on this belief that there is consistency throughout time and space in the laws of nature. Um, something people don't think about a lot is that science is not an individual effort. We have this picture of the sort of mad genius or the sort of the intrepid inventor and these are men of science. Well, no, uh, science is a collective effort. Yes, there are certain individuals who've had great ideas, right? But if you actually look at most of the Nobel Prizes awarded, and increasingly so as we come closer and closer to the, the present, uh, most of them are awarded to teams of scientists. Uh, so um, it oftentimes takes the expertise of many individuals. It certainly takes the labor of many graduate students. Um, and uh, it takes the community of scientists to really um, push back on ideas to make sure that they're strong enough to, to survive critique. Um, so it's a collective effort. Uh, science also leads to ongoing research. Getting the answer to one question doesn't mean that you're done. It oftentimes raises more questions. Uh, and finally, it benefits from scientific behavior. Um, there are there's this notion of the two magisteria that science answers the how questions of the universe how it happened and religion answers the why religion philosophy and so forth answered the why in other words you can have descriptions of how but how doesn't give you a lot of meaning okay um that's the purpose of um of religion and philosophy, some kinds of philosophy, is to give meaning to the things that happen in life. You can describe how all you want, but it doesn't change the fact at the end of the day that we are human beings who live in an existential sort of um, uh, 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 world where things happen, and sometimes they, they're hard to explain to ourselves, and the facts alone aren't enough to satisfy us. Okay, so one of the chief tools of science is the scientific method, and you were probably taught this in school, uh, that the scientific method is this nice, neat, linear sort of pattern, right? You make an observation, deduce from what you know to come up with a hypothesis you can test, and then you go test it with an experiment, right? And then you use the results of that. And it's a nice, neat line. No, nothing complicated about that at all, except that in practice, this isn't exactly a great def description of what science actually is in practice. Um, science is a process, okay? It's an ongoing process. That testing of ideas is a feedback loop. Uh, those ideas get tested and retested and retested, and every time they get reshaped a little bit more. Um, science doesn't just collect a body of meaningless facts. The work of science isn't the collection of the facts. The work of science is explaining the patterns in the facts, identifying patterns and explaining them. That is the goal of science. Uh, and science can only make sense of that through repeated examination and collective assessment. So science is oftentimes complex, and it's also very creative. It requires things like serendipity, inspiration, curiosity, all of that stuff. So to see why, I want to show you a sort of newer model of the scientific method that expands things a little bit. What you learned in school is still there. It's important, and it is central to the, to the way science works. It's there in the center under testing ideas. It's that green sphere in the center here. Um, outside of that, though, you also have these other three spheres that feed back into it. Um, the first is exploration and discovery. The second is community analysis and feedback. And the final one is benefits and outcomes. Now we start with exploration and discovery, though we can actually start almost anywhere in this 
diagram, but we're going to start with exploration and discovery. Ideas can be motivated by problems, they can be motivated by new technologies, they can be voted by personal motivations, serendipities, surprising observations from other experiments, and so forth. Uh, and this is a sphere in which you are asking questions and trying to clarify your ideas and exploring literature to find out how much we already know about the, what you're thinking about. Um, that then gets fed into and usually leads to um, the development of hypotheses. Okay, And those hypotheses are testable questions, uh, and we deduce from them what results we would expect if the hypothesis is true. Then we do the experiment and we compare what we actually got, what were the actual results and observations. If they are consistent with what we expected, great, the hypothesis is supported. It's another step in the way to being a great explanation. Um, however, if it's not, if it doesn't support the hypothesis, that's almost better sometimes. Not for your career, but for science, it certainly is. Um, it's going to force you to revise your assumptions. It's going to force you to think about, well, what are the reasons that it, what do I not know that could explain why the results were different? How can I find it out? It sort of being wrong actually drives and improves science. It's a necessary part of it. Um, so, um, you know, a great example of this at work is the way we saw um, the health advice for COVID develop in the first few months of this pandemic. Um, initially, there was a lot of stuff about don't wear masks, you don't need to wear masks, just wash your hands, you'll be fine, right? Well, that's because the data we had at that point kind of pointed to the idea that masks probably weren't necessarily that beneficial, but we had very limited data, and the data itself was mostly coming from sources that weren't necessarily reliable. So as more data came in, we got a clearer picture, and so our hypothesis that you don't need to wear masks had to be revised, and we had to sort of understand where the where the data was weak and where it was strong and and bring all of that together and it came to the eventual conclusion actually masks um, not only help you f keep you from getting sick they more importantly help keep you from spreading disease um and uh and that is the scientific method in in at work we we want science to have the answers right off the bat but when you have a new disease, a new situation that we don't have and that we haven't investigated yet, you have to go through this process and things will change during that, during the course of that. But the more data we get, the more testing we do, the more certain we become about our results. Now, the community aspect is incredibly important. After you test your idea, you got to bring it to other scientists. And there are formal ways of doing this through peer review uh, and publication, where you send it to a publisher, they send it to other experts in your field who then critique it. And don't just say, you should, oh, this is complete bull and I don't believe this. They have to give specific critiques. It's strong in these areas, it's weak in these areas. I think they need to consider this literature that they didn't address. And there's a big question in here that they haven't answered that could change the, their conclusion. All of that kind of feedback, basically. It's important. It's extremely important. It should, ideally, there's some questions about whether in practice it does, but it should improve the... Um, the uh, uh, the explanations that we come up with. Um, in addition, there are replication studies. The reason you publish is so is ideally, unfortunately, it doesn't really work out this way all the time, but ideally so that other people can perform the same experiments and see if they get the same results. If they don't, then we have to start asking questions about whether it was just a fluke that you got these. Um, 
discussions with colleagues are it's just sharing knowledge it's a more informal way of doing all of this so community is incredibly important in science you can't do it yourself finally the benefits and outcomes benefits are sometimes they're predictable sometimes you have a benefit or outcome in mind when you're doing the research right i am trying to find a better superconductor so that we can make more efficient microchips, right? Great, you know. Uh, but oftentimes the things you discover may not have obvious uses, and that doesn't mean that they're useless research. It just means that the pieces haven't been put together yet. Um, but oftentimes, whether it's intentional or not, research can benefit social issues. It informs pol or should inform policy. Um, help develop new technologies, build knowledge, satisfy curiosity. That's a valid reason to do research. Um, and solving everyday problems. So there are a lot of ways that the scientific process goes on. And that's a whole separate uh, sphere where you go from the lab to manufacturing or policy or, you know, so forth. So, so that's the larger scientific method. What you learned in high school and, and grade school is still in there in that green sphere of testing ideas. That It's still there and it's still central to what we do and how we produce knowledge. But there's a lot else that goes into it. Finally today, I want to talk about uh, some terms that often get confused. Um, there are a number of terms in science that look like terms we use in everyday English, but have very different definitions. Okay. Um, if I was going to ask you, in fact, take, take a minute after I explain this to pause the video and rank these four words, laws, facts, theories, hypotheses, in the order from the ones you think are the most certain in terms of uh, explaining the world and the ones that are the least certain in terms of explaining the world. Go ahead and do that now. If you're still with me, <laughs> welcome back. Um, most people come up with rankings that look like this. This is actually, somebody actually exper did an experiment. They ran a, a study where they asked people to do this, and this was the co most common ranking that came out of that. Facts are the most important, laws come next, then theories, and hypotheses are the least important, least certain. In reality, it's really the opposite. Theories are the most certain thing in science. They are as close to the truth as we can get, because you can never be absolutely true or absolutely certain. But you can be almost absolutely certain. And that's what theories are. Um, laws are just below that. Um, hypotheses come next. And facts come last. They're the least, I don't want to say least important, but they're the least certain thing. They have the least context. All a fact is, is a confirmed observation. It means two people have gone out, measured the same thing, observed the same thing under the same conditions, and it has been confirmed. Okay? Um... The more people that do that, the more confirmation we get, and that's great. But really, the facts themselves aren't important. It's the patterns we find in the facts and the ways we explain those patterns that are what's important. The facts are just there, right? They're building blocks. They're like Legos, but you got to, it's, the point of Legos isn't just to sort of have a pile of them, right? Right? is to connect them in ways that make sense to you. Um, so the next step in that would be building hypotheses. Hypotheses are very simple statements. They basically, in some way, fit the form, if X, then Y. Under these conditions, this will happen. And then we can test that. Okay? Um... We set up those conditions, and we see if it happens. Uh, you can either do this directly, like 
in a lab with test tubes. You can set it up and set up a chemical reaction, or you can make predictions about what you will see out there in the world. That's how a lot of evolution works, because we can't see a lot of macroevolution on human lifetime scales. Um, oftentimes what we do is say, okay, if this hypothesis is true, these are the things we're going to see in the fossil record. And then we go out and see if we can find fossils like that. Uh, and that's one way of testing hypotheses in evolution. Um, the important thing is that the statement is falsifiable. That is, it is a statement in such a way that you will either support the statement or the data is either going to support the statement or conflict with the statement. It may be inconclusive too, but you're really headed towards one of those two. Um, and hypotheses are sort of, um, you know, I'm going to back up. I think facts aren't even the bricks in Legos. I think facts are just the plastic that you pour into them. <laughs> The bricks you build together are hypotheses, and you put them together to arrange them to form laws and theories. Uh, laws are, are extremely useful empirical generalizations. So they say, based on a series of fact, confirmed facts, hypotheses, and observations, um, under certain conditions, this happens. Okay? Uh, it's an it's a generalization about the world. Um, the thing about laws is they can change. Okay, uh, there might be certain conditions we haven't found yet under which it doesn't work. Uh, that doesn't mean the law is no longer true. It just means we have to add the caveat that under these conditions it doesn't work. Um, and new observations can modify the law because of that. The most important difference between a law and a theory, though, is a law is a generalization, but it's not an explanation. It doesn't say, it doesn't say deep down how that thing happens. It just says that it does happen. Theories, finally, are well substantiated explanations of some aspect of the natural world. They are not a guess. They are not a hunch. There is not the idea of absolute uncertainty in this. Um, a theory is built on a large body of confirmed facts, established laws, inferences, tested hypotheses, deduction, all of these things. It's a whole bunch. Um, you can think of theory theories like a table with a hundred legs, right? If you just remove one or two of those legs, prove one of those or one or two of those hypotheses, say, don't actually hold true, that doesn't mean the table's going to fall over. Okay, you got to explain why they're not holding true, but it doesn't mean the theory is going to fall. On the other hand. If you've got a table that only has three legs and you remove one of them, now you've got a table with two legs and it can't stand at all. The more legs you have, the more stable the theory is. So the more facts, hypotheses, and so forth that have been confirmed, um, the more certain we are of that theory. But again, it's important to also note we're never 100% sure. We'd be 99.9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
So when we talk about theories in science, if you hear somebody say, oh, evolution is just a theory. Yeah, it is just a theory. But a theory means it's incredibly certain. So you're not saying what you think you're saying. <laughs> so um, bear that in mind as we move forward here. Um, this is a, this is an important thing to understand because this idea that science is a process and the goal is to come up with these explanations is the central take-home message here. That said, thank you for joining me and um, take care of yourself. Bye-bye.